This is the first uh, working session, session one, new technologies and challenges to the non-proliferation and disarmament. I am chairing this session. I am Carlo Scherf, former professor of physics at the University of Rome, and I, was, I am interested in this activity, uh, was interested in this activity, I am now interested as a kind of hobby. So I don't know really why I'm here. We have three speakers on this panel to start the discussion. Wolfgang Redischauer will speak first, Megan Palme will speak second, and Sandro Zero will speak third. So may I give the floor to Wolfgang Redischauer, who is the director of Weapon of Mass Destruction Non Proliferation Center of NATO. Wolfgang, please. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Carlo, and, and, and I'm, I'm really impressed by the number of people here in the room, so I, I hope what I, what I say is not uh, uh, something that you already know, because probably most of you are more experts than I am. Just to say one more word on, on my, uh, my previous career. Uh, I started in NATO about uh, a year and a half ago, but before that I was working in various positions with and, and um, inside the European Union, uh, last chairing the uh, working group on non-proliferation on the EU side, uh, but by profession I'm a German diplomat, career diplomat, so I'm on secondment more or less to, to NATO. Um, and here starts my general disclaimer. I'm, I'm speaking today in a personal capacity. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the NATO because we are looking into the future and some of the issues that I will raise, some of the things we look at haven't been discussed uh, in, in detail in NATO. There is no common position on, on, on those things. So uh, please take what I say as, uh, as personal reflections uh, looking into the, the future. Um, uh, it's some, some of it probably is visions, um, and uh, the, a very important personality who died yesterday, Helmut Schmidt, once said, uh, if I start to have uh, visions, I go to see a doctor. So um, what, what, I, what I want to talk about is just to give you an impression, what are the things we, we at NATO look at, and, and I personally look at uh, with my team. Um, so, use of WMD certainly is not a new development. Newly available technologies have always been used in warfare, uh, such as the widespread use of chemicals in the First World War, and we are celebrating, and I think there is a panel next door, uh, the 100 years of, of the Battle of Ypres. And um, when nuclear research was mature, nuclear weapons were used. Um, uh, even before nuclear energy was used uh, uh, for civil purposes in a, in a major way. Today, as uh, IT technology advances and cyberspace is changing our way of life, the use of cyber attacks in warfare is becoming a real threat. Tomorrow, nuclear fusion bombs, high-powered microwaves, hypersonic kinetic energy weapons, ultra-high explosives, and geophysical manipulation have been named as potential new forms of WMD. All of these things um, um, bring also about how to deal with them from an arms control and disarmament perspective. But let me start just briefly with uh, what, what is a WMD. The most commonly used definition is the one used by the UN, uh, which says atomic explosive weapons, radioactive material weapons, lethal chemical and biological weapons, and weapons developed in the future which might have characteristics comparable in destructive effects of those of the atomic bomb or other weapons mentioned above. And interestingly to note uh, in this definition is uh, which was developed actually in the late 1940s to allow for the possibility of entirely new forms of WMD emerging in the future. And it does not address all the, um, uh, all the issues of whether the use of WMD uh, is, a state or non -state, uh, is by a state or non-state actors. It only looks at the destructive effects. So what are the new technologies uh, that we, we have to look at? Um, in the nuclear field, obviously, uh, new weapons designed with smaller yields using smaller amounts of fissile materials, more widespread and potentially cheaper use of laser isotope separation techniques, uh, some call it do-it-yourself do enrichment, that are more difficult to detect due to smaller size. New pathways of fissile material production, uh, such as thorium reactors, smaller, easier-to-handle reactor types, 
easier access to radiological material to non-state actors due to their expanded use in industrial, health, or other civil application, and the possibility to disrupt protection systems through targeted cyber attacks. And not to forget new ways of producing sensitive equipment through 3D printing uh, techniques, the so-called additive manufacturing process that in the future might allow to bypass traditional export controls. In the chemical field, the, technology, uh, the technological advances are even greater and more, more likely available um, in the chemical and bio field than in the nuclear field due to a number of factors. First, the rapid development and broader distribution of life sciences on a global scale. The growing convergence of chemical and biological processes, uh, for example, micro-reactors, bioreactors, genetic manipulation, and bioengineering, I think... Uh, the colleague on the left will, will talk about it. The increased use of replicating processes, more effective CV delivery methods, the use of combinations of chemical that make defense and attribution more difficult, and so on. In the biological field, there is a growing understanding of genetic modification techniques, availability of data, and spread of bioengineering knowledges, a knowledge, there is a modification, the possible modification of existing biological weapon pathogens, the development of new pathogens, development of combined CV and biological weapons are thinkable, and furthermore, there is an increased risk of naturally occurring pathogens, such as Ebola, HN, H1 and 5, MERS, being used by non-state actors against uh, foreign deployed troops, including those assisting in crisis operations and through uh, human messages. And we are looking at NATO uh, specifically into those aspects. Finally, there are new developments in the fields of vectors and WMD delivery vehicles, and, and I just dr drop a few uh, words, that is drones and UAVs, hypersonic vehicles, railgun technologies, and there are probably many others. And then when it comes to new actors and scenarios, we also need to look beyond technologies at the use of WMD and cyber technologies in so-called hybrid scenarios to create massive disruption uh, instead of massive destruction. An example obviously includes cyber attacks on nuclear, chemical, or biological f facilities, attacks on critical infrastructures, use of cyber attacks to overcome or disrupt access denial system to critical and protected infrastructure, and finally creating chaos and economic disruption, often non-attributable to a specific actor, weakening an adversary's, adversary's defense capability, and uh, uh, one example is, um, uh, which I just recently came about, the use of a very um, simple technology, which is helium-filled balloons with uh, chemical IEDs attached in mass launches by Syrian rebels to disrupt or disturb a Russian airplane attacks. So you can use very simple instruments, launch 50 or 100 of balloons, and, and keep uh, Russian planes away from, uh, from where you are uh, um, uh, concentrating yourself. So to sum up, uh, NATO, and this is more an, an, an official uh, version, uh, NATO strategic foresight analysis concludes that by 2030, uh, more actors will have access to WMD and um, leading to increased possibility of their use due to the globalization and technological proliferation will not only have greater access, but also the ability to rapidly transmit the weapons components anywhere. Chemical, biological, and radiological weapons will be universally available to almost anyone with enough financial resources, including states and state-sponsored groups, emergent powers, non-state actors, separatist groups, and liberation movements, and what they call super empowered, empowered individuals. I actually don't know what that, that, that means, but uh, that's the term used in the strategic foresight analysis. Um, the WMD attacks will target, uh, will target overcrowded urban areas, critical infrastructures, uh, water and food supplies, as well as communication nodes. And the high-speed movement of contag contagion will increase the appeal of mega of megacities as targets for a biological uh, attack. 
And, I, and finally, computer networks and their near total interconnectedness will increase the ability of actors to execute WMD attacks via networks. So this provides a, a somehow overview of what uh, the people thinking on strategic foresight in NATO at the Allied Commander of Transformation think uh, ahead. And with this, uh, thank you very much for your attention and sorry for being too long. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. We have a rich menu, as you can see, I mean. But our next speaker is uh, Megan Palmer, Senior Research Scholar at William J. Perry Fellow in International Security, Center for International Security and Cooperation, Stanford University. Me Megan, please. Thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to present today. Um, I also speak in a personal capacity, and these comments do not reflect um, the position of the organizations I work with or for. My specialty is as a biological engineer who's been focusing on the study and practice of international security and cooperation. Um, for the last five years, I directed part of the largest U.S. federally funded research program in synthetic biology. This center brought together researchers, industry players, and policymakers, and my programs focused on policy-related research focused on safety, security, and more generally on how we might manage the changing relationships and power dynamics with respect to the evolution of biological technologies as well as the evolution of the institutions intended to promote and ensure their beneficial and responsible development. Several reflections on the challenges posed by advances in biotechnology in particular in the context of our discussion and also other emerging technologies that are enabling new types of communities to yield increasingly powerful capacities and strategies that might be used to manage and benefit from these changes. But I thought it might be useful to start with a story that illustrates some key developments and challenges. Um, when I started my PhD in biological engineering at MIT just over a decade ago, Several faculty, inspired by developments um, in their native engineering fields, like robotics, decided to start a competition in genetic engineering called the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, or iGEM. They had a simple but powerful idea, create and leverage a new technology platform that allows for standard assembly of genetic functions, or parts, as they called them, and couple this to a new social innovation platform for distributed communities to be able to test, contribute to, and decide what best to do with biotechnology. This past fall, 280 teams from three, do three dozen countries gathered in Boston to share their achievements. Engineering, biology, innovations in materials, health, energy, and more. Most were university students. Some were in high school. Some were working in amateur do-it-yourself biology labs. For many, this was their first research experience. iGEM is a microcosm of developments in biotechnology. It's also a powerful observatory, a, uni a unique example of an emerging institution capable of spreading norms and practices globally faster than policy, and one that is experimenting with this role. The growth of this program and the organization that supports it have important attributes that highlight both challenges and opportunities for several areas of enabling technology. First is the development of strong norms within these organizations. It's notable that this competition was not set up as a competition amongst teams to produce the most powerful bug. It was teams competing against the limits of a technology. The founders have consistently set a strong norm of cooperation and responsibility within such a competition. Second has been communications and transparency. As the technology has evolved, the organization has had to evolve to provide complementary centralized support and memory to learn how to safely advance technologies. We've built a network mostly of volunteers who provide reviews to complement institutional support and take these lessons back to their communities. The limitation has come in how to help teams interpret what are becoming increasingly ambiguous and sometimes obsolete guidelines rules, and responsibilities institutionally, nationally, and internationally. This has become not trivial. This list-based regime for controlling technologies is often not capturing risky technologies being developed. Um, fourth has been community. The community is creating new relationships. One of the most important has been the sponsorship for the last five or six years of groups like the FBI Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate. 
Every year, the FBI and others, such as representation, uh, representatives from the BWC Implementation Support Unit, inform these students of their roles and responsibilities, thousands of them every year. For this is the most time they have heard this, it also scales relationships of communication between technology developers and intelligence communities. Again, the limitation has been the point of contact in other countries. Um, fifth has been incentives. We are able to explicitly reward innovations in safety and security alongside technology development. To get a medal, teams must come up with a new way of exploring the broader implications of technologies. This is not a focus on compliance, but one of engagement and leadership. And last is shifting control mechanisms. In the beginning, the competition, um, when the competition started, the enabling tool was the shipment of physical biological parts, and the limitation was figuring out how to use them, the tacit knowledge required. This is changing. Today, the limiting step for most team is still materials, but for most, teams are now turning to producing, synthesizing their parts locally. They are working with companies, commercializing kits um, to genetically engineer at home. Teams still frequently fail in their designs, but remarkably, many astound us in the sophistication of their accomplishments and sometimes in unexpected ways. As a result of these investments, we are seeing incredible cross-sector investments and developments. I also think we are seeing a scaling of, of interest and commitments to safety and security alongside technology. So this year, a team from Billafield actually won the Safety and Security Award for developing a report on how iGEM could be used to spread dual-use um, uh, technologies awareness across many different international communities and do capacity building in, in communities that have not used the technology before. So an important question has been what we can learn from this experience with, with the kids, if you will, and apply it to adults. Um, a few years ago, my colleagues and I started a fellowship program in responsible biotechnology development that engages early to mid-career practitioners in academia, industry, and policy in designing and implementing new programs like iGEM. I won't have time to talk about it today, but I'll highlight a couple observations coming out of these discussions. First, most of the practitioners recognize uncertainties about the safety and security of work, but they don't feel capable or empowered to solve, engage, or um, even discuss these emergent problems. This is a significant problem, and we're seeing strains on institutions raised by, most importantly, uncertainties and ambiguities in whether or not we actually have the expertise to evaluate developments. This year has been notable in biological technologies. There's been quite a popularization and discussion of new powerful tools for gene editing. Um, these are raising long-standing conversations about how and where to draw legal and ethical lines. We're also seeing technologies um, to make new modes of selective inheritance like gene drives that are raising new questions about speed and scale. I would also argue that we are seeing new power dynamics in who is investing in biotechnology and to what ends. In particular, the US, seen as a, U.S. has seen a quadrupling of its budget and consolidation in work in biology in areas like, the, um, like DARPA, which is, uh, which is in many ways could be seen as signaling, and one that must absolutely be coupled with a strengthening of confidence around obligations to pursue the technology for peaceful purposes. I want to highlight, just to end, three challenges and three elements of a strategy to counteract them that I think I'd like to discuss. First is complexity. Speed and scale activities are going to be outpacing even the natural evolution of biological threats. We're also seeing complex motivations and drivers. Community structure, there is a reshaping of who is a participant and a blurring of boundaries between areas of expertise. And lastly, there's a footprint of organization of biotechnology is changing dramatically due to a suite of technologies that are decoupling information and materials where traditional controls and systems um, of detecting threats are no longer adequate. There are three key needs. One is on leadership. These topics are important and interesting, um, but we need more individuals who can stand up within technical communities as well and promote innovation and learning. There needs to be new centralized structure and oversight that more importantly monitor and create new channels of communication and expertise. And lastly, on learning to increase the communication again and monitoring of technologies in transparent and permissive ways. As a final comment, I think one of the largest challenges we face 
is institutionally reinforced ignorance on the role of technology in international cooperation and security, coupled with a lack of leadership on how we safeguard science and technology through engagement, especially with the fragile norms of the BWC. In particular, if I discussions, we also always turn to around increasing awareness among scientists and engineers can also be turned um, and often appear patronizing and stagnate on ambiguous conceptions of culture decoupled from realities of implementation. I would love to discuss mechanisms of engagement and empowerment in new, these new communities and love to see more scientists attending these meetings. Thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to discussion. Thank you very much, Mark. Okay. Thank you. The first speaker is uh, Sandro Zero, Vice President and Chief Export Control Officer of Areva. Sandro, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, I have just five minutes, so in case my preferred chairman would stop in the middle of the speech, I tell you the, the phrases that you should not forget, which is, the capacity of the governments and the industry to cooperate is the key factor for the effective export control system facing new proliferation changes. And, uh, and I speak on behalf of the Botticelli Secretariat. And uh, if you don't know yet what is Botticelli project, here there is a brochure for you uh, to read. One page, white, the other side. Yeah, this is my, my assistant. She said, uh, uh, I don't put anything on the back because you will not be able to turn over the page. So it's better to keep it white. This is the confidence, you know. <laughs> well, um, uh, my speech will be concerning the cooperation between institutions, governments, and uh, industry. Uh, just to tell you that uh, last year I was here and uh, uh, I was a little surprised that I didn't know in a, in a non-proliferation seminar anybody. Few faces. And I'm from the industry. So uh, I realized that maybe the industry should be more involved. And I was not the only one. Because uh, here, as chairman, it was uh, uh, Sibyl and uh, uh, Kai Kisler. And I remember after the speech, uh, I said, how can we, industry, help you, governments in this institution, to make effective the 1540 resolutions? And Kai uh, answered a kind of uh, uh, aggressive way, saying, you should involve. And I said, well, I thought that we were involved because we were respecting the law. I was wrong, because finally, the industry realizes that the first victim of the illicit trafficking is the industry. Industry who is performing illicit, of course, the trafficking. And we think as industry, and I do represent part of the industries here, uh, we spend too much time in controlling illicit trafficking, which is heavy for the industry to respect, and we should have more time for illicit ones. Anyway, since the issue of the 1540 Security Council resolution, the exporter of dual-use goods comply with the established regulations in order to support the efforts of governments and institutions to counter the risk of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The exporters of sensitive products are the most concerned by the risk of proliferation, and they are conscious to be the first barrier against proliferation. They know the risk, they know their products, the development that they do or, the, or they can do on their <coughs> products, their customers, and the markets, and are convinced that uh, an effective export control system is needed for the harmonious development of their civil business in the world. Uh, last November, November 2014, in the frame of the Wiesbaden uh, program for the 10th anniversary of the resolution, representatives from the major exporters were invited to a meeting in Frankfurt. Someone of you, maybe they were there, by the United uh, nations institutions, UNODA and the 1540 Committee, and by the U.S. 
and German governments, DOE, DOS, BAFA. The meeting was sponsored by the BAFA and the European Commission. In the meeting, the institutions invited the industry to take a greater role in the export control system, to involve themselves in the process and to take initiatives in order to support the mission of the 1540 Committee. And uh, it is uh, in response to that invitation that uh, in good cooperation with the 1540 Committee and UNODA, that the industry came together to present today the Botticelli project. The Botticelli members, and I just mentioned some of them, Airbus, Air Liquide, Alstom, Arriva, Biosafety Association Central Asia, Caucasus, Boeing, Systech Japan, is already started? No. <laughs> Digital Europe, EDF Energy, Ericsson, Essencia Chemical, Fiat AG, Itachi, ICTS, Athens, Maxell, Merck, OPCW, Philips, PNNL, Rolls Royce, Safran, Siemens, Sieps, Cipri, Thales, Velon Chemical, Westinghouse, and others, associations. Uh, plus, as observers, some governmental representatives from German, BAFA, from France, SBDI, and uh, the J uh, Research, the Joint Research Center. Well, the Botticelli members have decided to gather their forces in the most sensitive sectors, and I mentioned nuclear, biological, chemical, aerospace, telecommunications, and additionally was requested to us to integrate transport and the financial sectors and produce fundamental deliverables such as a reference internal compliance program, a reference export control guidelines for small, medium, and large enterprises, a reference export roster, specific training tool ticks, toolkits for developing and established countries, clear update and applicable list of sanctions and other related uh, documentations. Today we are pleased to officially present the industry initiative to this forum and uh, dearly wish through the Botticelli project to play our part for the success of the 1540 Committee Commission and the UNODA non-proliferation efforts. In order to move forward toward the deployment of the project, we uh, have invited the institutions to endorse the project and to find ways to contribute to these initiatives in terms of planning and funding. A delegation of Botticelli Secretariat has already a delegation of Botticelli Secretary has already uh, visited New York, invited by the UN, and we were honored to receive uh, a complimentary comments from these institutions and would wish that these are matched with close contribution from the UN. Mm, I'm finished, and I hope uh, in time. Thank you for questions. For this, thank you. Almost an hour for discussion. My instruction as chairman to be very strong, very strict. So very short questions and comments, please. Anything intelligent can be said in a few minutes. Please. about the potential for additive manufacturing having an impact in, in the bio sector. And I wonder, it's harder for me to understand uh, the manner in which uh, uh, additive manufacturing would, would impact uh, on uh, bio issues which might have a security uh, uh, dimension. If you could say anything about that, I would appreciate it. Uh, with res respect to Wolfgang, um, I'm really pleased that you, you mentioned this as, as one of the new technologies which merits more attention. I'm curious if you could say anything about what the EU may be doing 
uh, to address the challenge. Uh, I assume most of the focus is on uh, uh, the area of, of uh, centrifuge production, but if you could say anything about uh, what the EU is focused on in that domain, uh, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there are no more questions, so why don't you try a short answer, please? Um, thanks for that great question. Uh, regarding additive manufacturing, I think that bio um, is another example of a trend in a number of, um, I think, the, the, uh, at OECD, I think they're calling it new means of production, um, but a number of technologies enabling sort of distributed um, capabilities. With regards to its direct effects on biological technologies, there are um, a number of ways in which, uh, for example, microfluidic uh, device design is being enabled through 3D printing and other areas. Um, allowing the sort of manipulation of biological materials at different scales, um, as well as the direct printing of, um, of biological materials. Um, there are some interesting, although I don't think uh, frequent enough, conversations around the ways in which the protocols and standards underlying those technologies are coupled to um, sort of fundamental security and, ec and economic trade-offs in their um, infrastructure design, and some of those initiatives have started, but they're not, they're not frequent enough. Thank you. Please. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Bill. Very interesting uh, question. Um, before before um, looking at additive manu manufacturing, I just wanted to say a few words on uh, how we in NATO, and I'm not speaking any longer for the for the EU, uh, uh, look at some of these things. Uh, not only do we try to improve our CBN, CBR and defense capabilities and preparedness and, and fostering our, our training and capacity building of partners, but what we do is we have a program for, um, for research, a science, science and technology organization that looks exactly at, at those um, uh, uh, new technologies and developments and we have what is called a science for peace and security program where we can do together with partners research institutions and think tanks corporate projects looking into into research in new technologies that could be used uh, in in as weapons or in, in weapons uh, development. So there, there is some work ongoing in, in NATO. But when it comes to, um, to additive manufacturing, obviously this is one of the trends we are, we are looking at very heavily because it has very positive effects. It allows industrial production, small scale, in scale industrial productions. Even uh, I've heard examples of, of spare parts being produced uh, to, to support in very difficult uh, environments and missions the, 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 availability, the availability, availability of spare parts for, for planes and, and, and other um, uh, 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 military uh, uh, equipment use. So th it has a lot of beneficial uh, um, effects, but if you look at, uh, at a very recent article of Matthew Craning and Tristan Volpe, who, who identifies the positive and the negative aspects of, of this technology, uh, I, I think there are a lot of uh, very good recommendations how we should look at uh, expert control in this field, what can we do to um, to, to, to prevent these technologies being used for malicious purposes. And I think, and, and I'm not speaking, as I said, on behalf of the EU, I think that the EU colleagues in, in the room could perhaps add on, on how they are looking into these experts in terms of, of export controls. And I mentioned in the beginning that some of these technologies pose a lot of problems to arms control and disarmament, but in particular, they... Um, pose a lot of problems for traditional export controls. And I think we have to together have a, a common reflection on, on how these technologies and our export control systems uh, can, um, uh, how, how these new technologies can be better uh, implemented, better uh, introduced in how we do export controls. Because Traditional export controls look at uh, an equipment, a piece of equipment that is, uh, that is exported to somebody with addi uh, additive manufacturing. We are looking at a piece of software that is sent to somebody in a remote place that can do the, the, the manufacturing. So I think there is an, a huge issue to look at and probably the EU colleagues in the room can, 
uh, say a few words on how they are looking in on those aspects. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, now, uh, now we'll take a few questions, please. Please take note. Thank you so much. I have a question. Uh, Andrea Kuklitsky, Russian Center for Policy Studies. I have a question for Ms. Palmer. Um, the Biological Weapons Convention has been always criticized that it lacks the verification capability. From what you said, I understand that now, as the technology is getting much more accessible, uh, the verification becomes even less possible. So where we go from this in terms of any political solution to it, and how, how this issue can be solved now, or we just give up and not even thinking about it? Thank you. OK, one question here. Okay. Thank you. One third question there. Thank you. Okay, now, if you want to answer, in which order would you like to, why don't you go first? Um, again, thank you for the very good question. Um, with regards to the first question about where we are with regards to the ability to do verification, I think there is, it's not so simple as, as technology is becoming more accessible and harder to track and monitor. I actually think there's some really interesting in incentives um, and with respect to actually disclosing activities and contributing to shared resources that allow for um, an ease of, of monitoring uh, around the, the types of activities that are going on, but that is a very fragile infrastructure. So at, at iGEM, for instance, you know, teams um, are, are, allow, are gaining um, through the ability to use each other resource parts expertise, and that, that simple platform allows them to uh, allows us to understand and, and track back what has gone on when things go wrong, but it's very fragile. On the last um, question, very quickly, um, around opportunities for engagement of different communities, I think it, there's two, two things that are critical, um, is to position these as an opportunity for, um, for innovation and, and contributions, not just for mm -hmm. awareness building. It's a slight difference in capacity, and also, um, the opposite, provide venues for direct interaction and facilitate that, and I'd love to discuss that more. Please. Uh, first of all, I, I, I wish to answer back to this gentleman from Morocco concerning nanotechnologies as well as other basic technologies which are developed 
mostly in the university and the research centers. Uh, as long as those technologies uh, are related to dual use products, they are controlled the same way as a huge vessel passing the frontier. But if those technologies are not applied to dual use goods, they are free. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Angela, for uh, your comments. Uh, uh, effectively, uh, the, the, these people that we met, experts that we met uh, in October 30th in New York, they have suggested uh, this uh, group of uh, this association of industry to cooperate in the frame of the comprehensive review of the 1540 uh, resolution uh, next year. 2016, um, and we are willing and ready, and, uh, and uh, we welcome this uh, proposal, uh, which is one of the goals that we want to achieve uh, in, uh, uh, in this uh, project. Uh, the fundamental uh, problem is that uh, the industry is uh, uh, the regulated, and normally the regulators are governments and institutions, but the knowledge of the programs of the products, of the technology, of what a customer can do with the technology, and the most important problem here is not a pro product, is a technology, because I can push, or the thousand of, of uh, engineers can push on a button on the laptop, and all the technology of the nuclear power reactor goes to Pyongyang, <coughs> goes to Tehran. How to control? Everybody, uh, I'm not the police, I cannot uh, stick next to them uh, and to avoid uh, such a, so it is a culture, it is a real culture which should be uh, diffused in the industries. But as far as the industry will be considered as the exporters, the illegal exporters, the bad guy who wants to export uh, for money their products, uh, wherever is possible to do it, as long as we will be in this situation, it's not possible to spread this uh, culture. So what Botticelli proposes is exactly a cooperation between the regulators and the regulated in order to get an effective export control system where the victims, the first victim, the first victims is the industry. So we want to cooperate, I repeat, and we confirm that this project has been set up for this. Thank you. Wolfgang? Thank you. Uh, obviously, I can say a lot of on, on export controls, yes, but I wanted to take up the, the point on, uh, on cooperation with the, the, the South. Uh, what we are doing at NATO, we have a number of, of partnership programs where we specially work with, with uh, some of the North African and Middle East uh, countries in, in fostering uh, and empowering and do capacity building for partners to look at the risks uh, that are involved with, with WMD. Uh, we do have a number of uh, awareness and, and outreach activities, seminars and conferences. For example, we have an annual WMD conference that addresses some of the threats um, that, that are referred to. Uh, and we, we, we actually had this conference in Qatar in, in May this year, so we are actively going out uh, two international partners and, and two countries of the South and, and speaking with them uh, at, at some of the risks and obviously then in their governmental uh, activities they have to look at things like export control, like uh, controlling borders and, and things so and, and uh, we assist them in protecting uh, in case of, uh, of uh, cyber and uh, events uh, how to build up the necessary defense capabilities. Thank you. Thank you.
It's one thing to print certain components, for example, such as these components of cooling water pumps, but there's still the issue about uh, the properties of the material, material dynamics, and so on. If you printed a centrifuge, it has to spin at a great velocity, and it's still very difficult to use Moratin steel, tungsten, and other types of metals for 3D printing. So there's the theory part of it, but there's also the practical aspect of it. And I was wondering whether you could comment on that, particularly in terms of the vulnerability of the steel in the Thank you. One more question at the bottom. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Brandon Bowen from Aberystwyth University. Um, two short questions uh, that I, they might be difficult to answer and I appreciate any thoughts from all the panel on them. Uh, the first is, uh, among the great range of emerging technologies, which do you think uh, there'll be the most practical and effective international controls? And secondly, which of these technologies are you most concerned about? And they need not necessarily be the same to the two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Ali, please. Yes. Uh, so, Tanya, from the Ambassador of the UN in Vienna, Geneva, I was chief negotiator at Balaji, but I'm not going to talk to nuclear. Surprisingly, I'm talking about Balaji now today. Uh, I was uh, involved with three years of negotiation. Now, the question is, and everybody knows that the U.S. disagreed, therefore the whole thing is in uh, dormant. Therefore, 10 years of negotiation, we were not able to have the organization for verification of our agreement. Now, since then, uh, looking uh, yourself, of course, being an expert in this field, advances in Balaji, do you think that, that the text that we were negotiating almost 10 years for verification could apply now? Or the technology is so advanced that everything should be revisited? Of course, at that time, I remember that I asked the European Union friends, at least all of us will agree to the text and let's have the organization. But some of the friends from Europe, they said, no, our biological uh, side is industry do not agree that they will be exempt, uh, the US uh, competitor will be exempted from inspection and we will do their work. No, either everybody should be on board or we will not agree. Otherwise, we should have. Now the question is simple. Will that be in a better situation if we had uh, agreed and we had organization for the last almost 15 years, verification, or we are now uh, in facing more insecurity right now? Okay, now we just start from my right. Okay, <clears throat> I, I will uh, start with, with uh, Tarek's question on, on 3D and 4D printing. Uh, I'm not an expert in, in 4D printing yet. I'm, I'm still looking at the fourth dimension, which uh, I, have, I have difficulties to grapple with. But w w what this points to is the, the, the question that the technology develops so quickly and the awareness, and we heard that from, um, from Megan, uh, is it, it needs to be spread to those people working with these uh, the, these new technologies that we are facing a new risk which we, we couldn't imagine uh, a few years ago and um, this this again um, points to uh, that that we really need to look very careful at what are the what are the technology holders? What are the risks of, of, of spreading? And how can we, uh, through expert control mechanisms or other mechanisms, uh, look at the spreading of this technology around the world? And I combine this with the, the uh, other question, uh, what is the, the greatest risk in the, in, in, the, in the field which we see? Um, and again, referring to the foresight uh, um, report of, of the Allied Commander of Transformation, well, they said they were looking at to, in technologies by 2013 and developments by 2013, and that they said they are incapable of um, uh, being too concrete on chemical and biological because the, the, the developments are so fast that they can have a, a five, perhaps 10 years forecast of developments, but not a 15 or 20 years forecast. So it's there where the risk lies. I don't think it's really in the nuclear field. We know what the technologies are. Uh, are. We know that there, there are new methods of developing or, or, or uh, creating some, some capacities, but the risks are known in, in the nuclear field. The risks in the chemical and biological field are much less known. And as I said, to the point that uh, people who are looking really into the future are, are incapable of, of uh, looking into a 15, 20 years uh, per perspective. And, and just to give you one example, I've seen a map uh, recently showing 
uh, about 100 spots around the world where chemical uh, production takes place. And these 100 spots around the world were the subsidiaries of one uh, company, uh, global company, uh, uh, in the biological field. How do you even as a company, and that question goes probably to, to uh, Sandro, how do you control as a company what happens with your technology if, if it's spread around 100 plus uh, subsidiaries around the world? Thank you. Thank you. Sandro? Okay, two questions. Uh, let's start from uh, Raul first. Uh, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, you know that uh, we have uh, uh, internationally uh, a list of uh, products and related technology who is controlled. Uh, but uh, the industry uh, has uh, another constraint, which is uh, the catch-all. Uh, so one of the answers could be there is a catch-all, so this is up to the industry to alert the government that uh, a dangerous uh, user in the world as uh, uh, requesting some technologies which could be used for weapons of mass destruction. And this is uh, a, a decision taken by the industry. The other side is the government who has uh, with uh, intelligentsia, intelligence the possibility to know what uh, a newcomer in the field would like to do with this uh, technology. But uh, normally, the industry requests an end-user statement every time we export a sensitive product. So in the end-user statement, the beneficiary engage to use that technology for the specific civil utilization. Otherwise, the industry will not get export license to deliver the product. Uh, and, uh, and, and after the last uh, control, it's easy because uh, uh, when we have uh, normal customers, we don't check anymore if they are uh, sanctioned somewhere as OFAC or uh, EU restrictions or IAEA, but when there are newcomers, we check and we verify what this uh, beneficiary uh, would do with this uh, new equipment. <laughs> And we discuss, we uh, concert with our government to know what to do. Thank you. Megan, please. Uh, there are quite a few very rich questions there, so I'll try to do them justice. Uh, with regards to 3D and 4D printing, um, I think this is an area where we're exploring both um, the use and misuse of these technologies, and there's a considerable degree of uncertainty around the limits of foresight prediction and whether or not we should be experimenting even with the, the types of, um, of research that, that might resolve those uncertainties. Um, and so my my biggest hope is that the right now the disparate conversations that really have to do with ris risky research and um, capacities for sort of adaptive manufacturing are, are brought into a larger context and not siloed. Um, and so you could even say anything that has to do with genetic printing of material is a 4D technology because those materials replicate and, and do things. And so I point to a, a f several different discussions about that. Um, questions about w what are the most effective to control and which are the most concerning. I would say clearly where the most logical control points exist, though the, those are the ones that are easiest. So where there's clear materials, control points, that probably makes most sense. And so the ones that are concerning to me are most that rely upon very quickly changing and, and, and fragile uncertainties about um, but so the, the control points around, especially around um, export control, is a particular regime that may or may not be useful. So biology would fit in that, cyber and others that underlie many of the, these technologies. Um, the last question about should we reopen a discussion around verification and, and would we be better off right now? I, I generally think that it's not helpful to pick at old wounds that may cause people to come in with particular um, sentiments about what should or could have happened. 
I do think we have a key opportunity to rethink the mechanisms on how we scale and monitor beyond just at the, at the state level and, and who is empowered in those discussions. Um, regarding better or worse, I think anything that is focused purely on compliance and doesn't address the foundational problem of leadership on these topics and the willingness to draw lines is going to fail. Um, because uh, what we've learned is that we, at least in the communities that I engage with, any, anything that starts with just compliance is, is not uh, a particularly ongoing conversation. It's a, it's a box check and, and move on. Um, and so we really need to reinforce these lessons of what, it, what did it mean at one point to put up a strong norm? And what does that mean today in terms of these lines? I hope that comes through these conversations. Sorry, my question was not answered. Well, uh, my question fast, was, can please. you give me a technical answer I want to? Do you think that the mechanism of verification that we negotiated 10 years could be applied now, bearing in mind the last 10 or 15 years advancement in biological technology? Could we have the same verification system now? Or you, as an expert, can tell no. There have been so many advancements in biological technology that that mechanism could not be applied anymore. That is a technical question. Okay, you want to answer? Yes, please. My particular concern about any verification protocol is the limits of the expertise required to make those assessments. And I don't think we have developed the communities that are capable of having that, that assessment. Okay, now to the extreme left, topologically, of course. <laughs> Yes, thank you. thank you. My name is John Bielefeld. I'm a, a security consult nuclear security consultant from Germany. I have two questions. One question uh, for Dr. Palmer. Uh, you uh, talked a bit about the uh, iGEM competition, and you mentioned that the participants uh, receive a briefing by the FBI uh, to help raise awareness for some of the uh, security implications uh, of their work. You also mentioned that there was a problem finding points of contacts in some of the participants' uh, home countries. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit? And, and the other question, the second question is for Dr. Zero. Um, you told us about the Botticelli project, and, and you listed a couple of companies that were part of it, or that are part of it. Um, lots of major players, most of which are in Europe, in, in Japan, and North America. Is there any effort by this project, effort from the industry to bring in other players, smaller companies, and companies that are located elsewhere. Uh, so, so is there an outreach effort sort of in between the industry to, to different companies? Thank you. OK, yeah, please. Thank you. My name is Ali Rashid. I'm a policy advisor at Interpol Counterterrorism, CBRME branch. Uh, I have actually two comments. The first one is for Mr. Zero. Um, I represented the organization in the last years very delighted to, to hear about the Botticelli project as, as a very concrete outcome. Um, I would like also to announce that Interpol is about to launch a crypto infrastructure program, and we were actually looking for different ways of engaging with the industry uh, in a comprehensive fashion. Uh, I believe that SARC engaging with the Botticelli project uh, would be a, a very useful venue to start this engagement. Um, on that same note, uh, Interpol is chairing the working group for Critical infrastructure protection uh, that sits under the uh, or within the framework of the United Nations uh, Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force. Uh, there is 34 different UN agencies uh, that we are chairing under this umbrella, and one of the main pillars uh, that we're working on is the public-private partnerships. And again, we're looking for a comprehensive fashion and for a venue to engage with industry. Um, again, I, I think that from your um, initial description. Of project and comprehensive list of, of partners that would maybe constitute a, one of these venues that we should be operating. Um, the other comment is for Ms. Palmer. Um, we got the opportunity to represent our bioterrorism prevention effort in the European Jamboree uh, that happened in Lyon uh, a couple of years ago, and I personally gave a presentation next to my colleagues from the FBI and the US. Uh, it was quite easy because they came to Lyon, where our headquarters is, but we will definitely be delighted to keep uh, this engagement alive, uh, regardless where it's maybe it's taking place elsewhere in the world. Because we believe, obviously, in our role with advocacy and, and sending and outreach, uh, I 
and we believe that the Irish Open Commission is a scandalous. Um, we were surprised by the level of awareness that already existed and never stood us. Um, and we'll be delighted to keep representing the law enforcement community and the rules of the state for all such events. Thank you. Thank you. Lady, please. Thank you. My name is Jessica Hand. I'm head of the Arms Export Policy Department in the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And my question is, Mr. Zero, um, is there any consideration in the Botticelli program at the moment to engage with the Arms Trade Treaty? Because the Arms Trade Treaty has a specific provision for the role of industry and gives great importance to the value that industry can add to the whole issue of arms, arms control and the arms trade. And the engagement of a group such as Botticelli Group, I think, would be hugely beneficial. Thank you. Well, would you like to start? Please. Um, thanks for those questions. The point about the FBI briefing and points of contact, and this is mostly secondhand from the FBI, is that um, we've had great opportunity, I think it's for the last five or six years of them presenting as part of the, the, the jamboree, and, and I think most importantly, um, uh, appearing cool. <laughs> Somebody that these students want to be and want to work with. And um, the points of contact is more when it comes to the local representatives, the, the students come to know who their local WMD coordinator is in, in their, um, their hometown, and, and they get to meet them, and there's positive interactions that actually are not just on awareness building, but on actually the design of their projects that can help them win medals. And so there's an incentive structure there. Um, we don't have those same points of contact necessarily um, internationally, and I'm, I'm very glad to hear of other organizations that might be interested here. Um, I, I will note that this is a very small slice of the, of the community. And so to the extent that we can also hold up other examples of positive engagements uh, in other venues, I think that's a key opportunity. Thank you. Sandro? Um, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, starting from the gentleman from Germany. Uh, uh, we already have uh, Japanese uh, uh, associations uh, in the Botticelli and uh, we are working to have uh, individual companies in the project. And uh, so uh, we are working with the 1540 committee and the UNODA, who is helping us uh, to introduce the project uh, to their correspondents. Uh, our willing is to open to all the major companies, uh, as well as uh, the small one who have uh, a, a direct impact uh, with the export of sensitive products. Now, uh, around uh, all, every, each one of those companies who are big one, there are suppliers. There is a supply chain which is uh, huge. So what we are trying to work is to represent each one on his field, on his sector, all the supply chain that the major company use. Now, we don't refuse anybody in Botticelli, but uh, of course, uh, the, the, the major ones are the more safe because they can have uh, the structure around them. Uh, the second one is Ali. Yeah, I remember your name. Uh, well, uh, Botticelli is a structure. We have a secretariat, we have members, we have wrote the map, and uh, uh, we wish to be uh, council for governments, institutions. Why not FBI, Interpol? We have already been contacted by <laughs> FBI, of course, and Interpol. So we are giving expertise, and you know what is the number. Because I remember uh, who was uh, Kissinger. Okay, let me call uh, Europe. Which number? Okay. Well, now you have a number for the industry, which is, uh, which is <laughs> reporting from US, North America, Europe, <coughs> Japan, not yet China and Russia. And this is one of the work that uh, UNODA is doing for us. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> lady, but uh, I think that arms control is uh, too touchy for national uh, sovereignty. And we don't intend to, to, we can help, but uh, everybody will help his own government. It's difficult to, to propose uh, a service uh, or a cooperation 
internationally. We are ambitious, but not foolish. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, what? Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, do you think, uh, uh, I, I want to know your opinion. You don't think that the, this debate is misleading because the problem is not technological, it's not scientific, it's not uh, technology, technique. The problem is political because all the efforts, you know, to curb, to stop, you know, the proliferation, especially in the nuclear side, uh, was proven very short. Do you think that the, 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 the main effort must be, you know, um, should be uh, directed to the political side, not, not to the technical scientific, because technical scientific, all the efforts have proven to be short. And we have uh, recently, you know, the, the Iranian deal, you know, Iran can have, you know, the technology because there is cooperation between, you know, the, the, the countries of the South. What the, the American specialist who is done has called the green, green market, because now, now the problem in the, the, te with the technology, especially in the nuclear effect, is that the North is not has not yet the monopoly, you know. The South can, by them, the, the Southern countries, by themselves, can, you know, uh, uh, you know, build the bomb, uh, the, the, the nuclear bomb or uh, uh, chemical and biological. And there are very, um, um, there are very political, uh, great political motives to have this bomb, you know, uh, to strengthen their security, you know, because there is not an international uh, government to protect them. So thank you. Thank you. Lady, please. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Dix from the Foreign Office in the, in the UK. Um, there's been quite a lot of talk about the challenges, the pace of technology, the blurring of boundaries, the unclear motivations, and also about the shift in power dynamics for communities where own, who own the technology and, and how things are shifting. So my question is to whomever w wishes to take it, but it's about how, what's your sense of how the best, the best way to control and regulate this is? Is it about prohibition? Is it about deterrence? Or actually, given the shifts in power dynamics and the sorts of issues that have come out today, is it more about self-regulation? You want to start? Okay. Um, I, I take up this question also. I'm probably not the, the best person to to, to answer. Um, I think you have a point in all in in all three. We need we need to improve uh, and update and and look at our our traditional export control system. That's mainly for the the, the national governments uh, and for industry involvement to make uh, the the governments aware of what new technologies they are working upon. Uh, there is obviously uh, uh, an issue in 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 self regulation. Uh, again, it's uh, for industry research and and others to to look at. And as I said, uh, we we are we are trying to be uh, to look into the matter through some of our science for peace and, and, and security projects. Uh, but uh, the, the the real the real point is you need to be prepared to the unprepared. And that's uh, I wouldn't call this deterrence, but it's a question of being uh, 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 able to react to, to new developments, uh, being able to update your own technologies and means to, to potential new, uh, new risks. And I would come back to, to a point that was referred to earlier, that's uh, the cyber um, defense and cyber protection, and also critical infrastructure. I think uh, one of the technologies which we didn't really raise here because it's uh, it's an underlying technology is uh, is uh, the developments in 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 cyber and I, I referred to in in various instances how how with uh, inadequate cyber protection system you may you might foster some uh, proliferation some attacks on critical infrastructure this might be used by state and non non state actors in in hybrid scenarios. And, and this is an area where, including we in NATO, look very closely. We are, we are trying to build up our own cyber defense. We are working with allies on their cyber defense. And we are, uh, we are, we are certainly looking at what uh, future um, aspects of cyber defense uh, we haven't really looked at uh, and we will do through our science and technology organization and other um, entities and, and what has to be built up in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes. Um, respond quickly to both of those questions it, regarding whether the problem is the technology or the politics and how to solve it. Um, I think it's both the technologies and the politics, and particularly when the technologies exacerbate politics. And I think we need, as, as was just commented, um, communications platforms in particular that enable us to organize in wholly different ways are, are changing, um, changing who has a say in, and in what way. And so I think we can't um, ignore technologies. And I would put biotechnologies here that, that change the transactions between between communities, and so, um, I, and I do think there's a significant role of, of the sort of um, designs for governance in technology and in, in the limitations and the options that uh, that opens or closes. Um, best way to control. I think it's all three. <laughs> there's clearly um, strong norm setting and in, in, in sort of prohibition. The self-regulation of the community is vitally important in terms of soliciting new types of expertise to look at moving targets um, and provide information. Um, I do think that it's also, you know, that's necessary but not sufficient. Uh, we need reporting structures and enforcement structures that can respond when things go wrong, accidents and, and deliberate um, uses, and, and, and most importantly, track back and create systems of accountability. And I think. We need to innovate on that front <laughs> more deliberately. Thank you. Andrew? Oh, just a word for uh, the gentleman from uh, Morocco. Uh, the Botticelli project uh, is dealing with dual use, so uh, only civil applications, and that's it. Now, if there are other applications, so this is arms control, and this is a political issue, and we don't deal with. Okay, the gentleman there. I'm Scott Davis with the U.S. State Department. Um, my question sort of follows on the question about, uh, which sounded sort of like a spectrum starting with self-regulation to prohibition. Um, and we've talked a little bit about the, um, the BWC, the protocol that was negotiated as for the purpose of being a verification mechanism for the BWC and that we're no longer doing that. Um, another model for um, pursuing biosafety, biosecurity, um, and uh, control on relevant dual-use research is regulation um, and, you might say, common standards, uh, best practices. And I w wanted to ask uh, Megan Palmer whether wh what your view is on the prospects for the value of common bio-risk management uh, guidelines uh, that could be adopted um, internationally and what the role of the BWC might be in, in such a mechanism. Okay, the second question there. My name is Laura Rockwood. I'm from the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. And I have a question about cyber, and I'll admit my own uh, lack of knowledge on this. Have there been any initiatives to start looking at the negotiation of a treaty on cyber warfare? Um, I'm tempted to ask, are we too early or are we too late? Thank you. Okay. Well, how do you want to start? You want to start first? Go ahead. <coughs> We are probably too late, but the, 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 uh, I, I cannot really uh, uh, give a, a, a definite answer whether there, 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 is, uh, there is a lot of discussion. There are um, uh, experts looking at what could uh, an arms, uh, uh, arms control regime for cyber uh, look like. There have been many articles in the, in the, in the past. Uh, what I can say is that most recently there were some discussion between the United States and, and, and China on uh, perhaps a, a kind of self-regulation, uh, which is not necessarily an arms control regime, but uh, look into what, uh, what, what, uh, what are the vulnerabilities of, of both sides and, and how we can r uh, increase at least uh, transparency in, in, um, in, in the field. And I think 
transparency is the first thing that uh, it's very difficult to regulate uh, cyber, but transparency is probably one of the things that one should have to look at first. Uh, all good questions, all difficult. Um, <laughs> first of all, in, in um, sharing standards and, and best practices in bio-risk management, I think this is a huge opportunity. Um, there are, um, I've been in a number of recent conversations about um, sort of risk management and, and decision support tools for, for risk management. And um, notably, uh, there's been an attitude amongst many of the scientists I work with that sort of regulatory science is boring. Um, and that, that's a big problem. Um, this has to be a, an area where, you know, sort of standards and, and, and protocol development becomes something to be admired and something um, that people want to participate in. And there's nascent development of this. Um, but I do think there's also some key... Uh, developments that are needed to support this. There's really not a lot of transparency on current processes um, for how risk management is performed at many levels. And so being able to open up that, that process um, to others for uh, scrutiny and development is going to be in incredibly important. I think that the BWC um, is an important place to support these conversations, but the sort of intercessional processes around them are going to be important to figure out how to scale those conversations beyond just one room that's expensive to fly to. Um, the state of forensics, um, you know, there's a number of different developments that are very important, not just in finding out where biological stuff came from, um, but also in being able to track back the activities of individuals and their intentions and motivations. I think we're still struggling with fundamental limitations on, on humans collecting samples in standardized ways. <laughs> um, so I think that's still a limitation. And whether it's too early or too late um, with cyber, uh, I think that there is a key difference that I see working very closely with the center in cyber um, in, this, in this norm setting at the highest level. Um, you know, we talk about self-regulation and other things, but the, the reality at the end of the day is that we are discussing offensive, you know, offensive uses of cyber and the development of those programs. And so, you know, that's very different um, from bio, and I, I hope bio remains <laughs> different. <laughs> um, but I think that there could have been, could have been differences in, in the way these, we set those norms early on. I think perhaps that's too late. Any more questions from the public? <coughs> yes, please. Well, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much to the, the panel for an interesting debate and, and people for asking questions. My, my name is Rio Krum. I'm from uh, Estonian uh, Foreign Ministry. I work for the political department. And my second job is to chair Estonian Export Control Body uh, Licensing Authority. And listening to your presentation, Serge, I found myself thinking that how we actually do export controls nowadays what is the relation in terms of new technologies? And I figured out that uh, it takes, uh, I speculate, it takes about 10 years until the new technology with uh, uh, damaging capabilities finally ends up in the, in the control lists and uh, becomes uh, used as the uh, uh, basis of uh, export controls. First of all, you know, scientists develop technology, then there will be some uh, discussion on the scientific level, then it goes to, to the governments, to the uh, export control regimes, to the technical expert groups that uh, digest the idea, uh, then there will be political decision making, and at the end, at least in case of the European Union, it takes uh, one or two or maybe even more years to finalize the at least two values control list. So, do we like it or not, uh, the controls is about 10 years behind the actual uh, technology developments. And my question will be, do you foresee any way of sort of diminishing the time 
between new technologies uh, are getting public and the actual controls we put on them. Do we need something new in terms of uh, making controls? Do we need to create the international scientific body to really develop those controls instead of uh, control regimes? Okay, thank you. Luca, if you want to answer, please, Sandro. Yeah, this is a partial answer you can imagine on this issue. But uh, the ones who are performing new technologies and are, uh, are research centers and uh, uh, mostly under contract with industries. Um, I would say that uh, what you are talking about uh, is a very little percentage of what is going to be exported because before that the technology is qualified, it takes time and you cannot export and even a customer will not uh, buy <laughs> a not qualified uh, technology. So the 10 years you are talking about uh, is uh, a normal time to export, so to focus on the qualification of the technology first. Second one, every year all the new technology producers have a, a review with their own government in order to fill up every five years uh, uh, the new uh, version of the dual use list. So uh, this conversation between industry and government is uh, uh, regular on the new technologies. The problem that I see is that uh, I remember when I first uh, took uh, the regulation, the EU regulation, for instance, it was less than 200 pages. Today is uh, 250 pages. So everything is a kind of a mi-fay, we say in French. You add layers, you never withdraw anything. Even if the technology is uh, spread out everywhere and very well known everywhere. Now, the politicians or the expert that you are, you understand that uh, doesn't have any sense to have an export license for a well-known technology who is used everywhere in the world. Well, the administrative people who take care of the application form, they don't uh, uh, use the same uh, uh, wording of developing and so on. They apply the rules, they fill up application forms, they uh, uh, fill up uh, Excel tables, and it is very heavy for the industry, even if you export uh, a very dual use, but very uh, spread out in the world product from uh, Spain to Italy. And you use exactly the same regulation as you were going to export a nuclear power plant to Pyongyang. And I don't use any more what I was used in the past to say from Madrid to Tehran. Now I use Pyongyang. It's, <laughs> it's much easier. Doesn't let me be quiet. <laughs> not for you, not for you. <laughs> okay, do you want to add something? Uh, just very quickly, I've, I've spoken enough, but I, I think it is. Um, sort of two sides of this. I think that even though these processes are very slow, they're still important for convening the discussions around them. So that, that remains important. Um, but the second, I think there is, it, it's important to, I, I love the idea of mechanisms to take things off the bureaucrat or off the administration over time, but also mechanisms that can, sort of these hierarchical top-down decisions that can enable better information to be coming up in terms of triggers in the system over time, and most importantly, understanding um, that it, the transactions may also be local, so understanding the producers and users and, and thinking about export controls, maybe in, it's not export controls in that way, but the, the other um, transactions that may be important and not covered by export. I'd be interested in discussing that more. Thank you. Tariq? Um, yes, I wanted to come back to both uh, Megan Farmer and Wolfgang Rudishhauser. I'm also a little bit concerned about the securitization of this discussion. You know, science advances through openness, collaboration, and so on. And so particularly in the biofield, now that we are concerned about avian uh, diseases and um, other potential pandemics, and if we close off this discussion and scientific collaboration among different institutes, 
it will have an impact on human development and human health. So how do you balance the risks with the advancement of science? Um, and some of my colleagues uh, who are working at CIPRI are also concerned about this, what's called the gain of function, where you do research where you can manipulate genes to do other things that they were not designed to do. And again, there is concern about research in various uh, laboratories with high levels of biosafety and securitization. And so where does one draw the line? So probably you should dig first. Sure. Um, I think this is really important. I think the cultural framing, um, uh, even, so I, I'm a biological engineer by background. I never thought I would work in security. Um, and, and many of the communities I deal with have the same, same attitude. Um, I, th I think that there needs to be more nuance to the discussion about the security we get through openness and transparency in our processes um, that would engage other communities. I also think there's an important framing around um, the sort of constant battle that we're waging with the natural environment and its capacity to evolve in ways that we may not know. And, and we often um, don't remember that discussion, especially in these gain of function um, gain of function discussion insofar as they, they are laying out a conceptual framing for risk management. And, um, and moreover, um, the idea that we can have a no, or that we exist in a no risk environment is, is simply not true. And acknowledgement of that and the extent to which we are, are dealing with these uncertainties needs to happen at, um, within these discussions. Your last comment. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tariq. I, 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 I can say very much more than, than Megan. The, the only thing I would, uh, I would say is that we, we are not trying to regulate or we cannot uh, regulate any, anything. We are, we are looking at risks and we are looking at how we can protect against risks. So we are, we are looking at what, what, what do we need to protect uh, uh, our populations, our territories, and, and, and our troops uh, against uh, new risks. Uh, we are looking at things like uh, uh, disease surveillance, so to see whether a, national, uh, a natural outbreak of a, of a disease which could have an underlying uh, malicious uh, purpose uh, or, or um, an underlying uh, unnatural outbreak, whether uh, how this is spreading, how this would affect uh, populations or, or troops deployed abroad, and, and, and how we can best uh, uh, react quickly and, and, and protect them. Though that's the way we are looking at it. We are, we are not uh, in any, any way engaged in uh, the, the discussion between bio-risks and bio-benefits, uh, so to say. Okay, well, that's the end of our discussion. Let's thank our speakers, Amin. Well.